Well, good morning again, my hillside friends and family. What a joy to be with you again this morning. I want to thank you for all the wonderful feedback that I've been getting via WhatsApp and emails and messages. Thank you for all your encouraging messages. Such a joy for me as a pastor to know that folks are being blessed and that God is speaking to you into your circumstances as we go and look into His Word together. We are truly a privileged people to have God's Word. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about too much else. I want to jump right in and pick up where we left off last week. Remember, last week we started speaking about contentment. And one of the passages of Scripture that I focused on was Paul's writing to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 4, remember, where he told them that God would supply all their needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. So that was powerful. Now, I, I feel that the essence that would best capture the thrust of Paul's exhortation to the Philippians, if you, if you look at the whole context of that fourth chapter that we mentioned, I, I think the essence there actually is not so much about supply. Although supply is certainly a major element of it, but I think the real focus lies elsewhere. I, I, I believe the word that comes to mind has to do with supply, but 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 supply in the sense of the person knows that their supply is secure and sound. And that word is the word peace. Peace. Peace is another of those priceless good gifts that God gives to his children. It is that authentic, unshakable peace that has sustained saints throughout time and can only be found in Christ Jesus. You know, we can go through times of peace, but worldly peace, you know, where all of a sudden it seems like we got that job and it seems like everything's going to be okay, or it seems like the economy is okay for a while, or the war has uh, uh, stopped on our borders. But let me tell you, that is not the true kind of peace that we're speaking about. I I'm talking about true, eternal peace that can only be found in Christ Jesus. If, if you want to know the value of peace, I'm talking about true peace, then just spend a bit of time with someone who has been without it for a while. And I don't mean to sound callous, but listen to me. Don't spend too much time with that person because their anxiety has got a way of rubbing off on you. Spend just enough time with that person to minister with them or, 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 or to gain from them and a fresh insight and, and then you need to go wash yourself from that anxiety again and just plead the blood of Jesus and pray for that person and pray for yourself as well. When you spend time with somebody that has been without peace for a while, you'll start to understand the true value of peace. I think about the last time, for example, perhaps, that your peace had been robbed from you for some reason or another. Do you remember that time? Do, do you remember those sleepless nights? Do you remember that knot in your stomach? You know, it's almost that, it's like a constant feeling of butterflies all the time. Do, do you remember your appetite doing all sorts of weird things, man? One day you you can't eat a thing, the next day you can't stop eating. What about the heartburn or the reflux that became a constant companion to you? Do you remember that, that, that weight around your chest feels like a belt just pulling tight? Do you remember that, that surge of fear every time the phone rang? See, listen, that, that was never God's will for His people. It's never His will. But that's the place. That, that, that discontent will lead you to. Discontent, the opposite of the contentment that I've been speaking about. The scripture says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It, 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 is, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. That's the love of of money. Now I've heard people trying to do all sorts of teachings and say, yes, the love of money, not money itself. But man, I tell you something, 
it's it's like have you seen ever seen these guys handling these snakes hey i don't know if you've seen oh man i've seen it on youtube and all the place and i think to myself you now those are chaps that are experienced man and every now and then uh, they'll get a they'll get a tag from one of those snakes eh? it's inevitable money is the same way people will turn around and say yeah no it's not money it's the love of money and we understand that as well but i'm saying be very careful because you're handling a viper in your hand because it's the world system so very be very careful how you handle that viper because if you're not careful it'll turn around and bite you one of these days if ever there's an area in our lives where discontent has to be and that has to be in the area of money this is because money has the ability to impact most of the other areas of our lives how many of us have thought that if only we had a better bank account if only our bank balance was a little healthier man the world would be a better place how many of us have thought if we had a bit more money we wouldn't be carrying this kind of stress wouldn't be ca carrying this kind of burden that we've been carrying all our problems would be taken care of right wrong if you've not mastered the discipline of contentment then you will never have enough money listen to me carefully if you've not mastered the discipline of contentment then you will never have enough money no matter how much you have in your bank account no matter how many assets you own if you've not mastered the discipline of contentment then you will never have enough do you remember that definition of poverty we mentioned last week poverty is not having enough do you see that there are some people that own mountains of cash and yet they are impoverished their mountains are not enough this is why the blessing of the apostle john is so profound and so loaded with insight he said beloved i wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers 3 john 1 and verse 2 from the king james version true prosperity is not a reflection of what you have in the bank true prosperity is not a reflection of how sound your investment portfolio is true prosperity has to do with the health of your soul and the currency of that prosperity is not restricted to the economic indicators or the exchange rate now america has got its dollar japan has got its yen south africa's got its rand the countries of the world all exchange their currencies on the markets of this world but the currency of those who belong to the kingdom of god the currency of soul prosperity is not the rand or the dollar or the yen or any of the others the currency of soul prosperity is contentment for it is when you are content in god that truly content with god that you will understand that you are free from the oppressive financial systems of this world yes you require money to live and participate in the affairs of this world god destined it like that that's why he placed you in the world but but in the relationship of commerce godly contentment establishes firmly that god is the master and money is the servant in your life contentment establishes firmly that god is the master and the servant is money although money impacts many areas of our lives discontent floods beyond the banks of mammon for example are you content with what you look like or are you are you content with how god made you or, or do you have an urge to let the plastic surgeon transform you into his area of expertise that is plastic do you want to be a plastic person hmm. so many people are discontent with how they look are you telling god that he's not good at what he does do you not see the beauty in who god made you to be 
So what if you look different to those pin-up plastic models? You're not plastic. You're a genuine human being, man. Are you content with being a little bit taller or a little bit shorter than everybody else? I, I guarantee you that there are many people in the oncology ward that would love to have your body right now. A as short or as chubby as it is, they would love to have just one pain-free day or the promise of just one more year with their loved ones. Even if it is living in your short, chubby body. Even if it is living in your tall, gangly body. We complain about what our bodies look like, and yet we don't spend enough time thanking God that we have the gift of health. Oh, you need to repent and make friends with that body that God has given to you, because it is a beautiful, beautiful gift. What about your social awkwardness? Do you have prosperity in your thoughts about yourself? Contentment in who God made you to be. So what if you don't know all the latest names of the sports teams? Far too many Christians are far too preoccupied with knowing who the latest rugby players are for the team of their country, but they don't know what the biblical texts are. So what if you can't hold a conversation with somebody about the latest arts or crafts or so what? Are you good in your conversation about the things of God? Now these are the things that truly matter. Don't allow yourself to be socially awkward because you don't have an understanding of all these things that make the world tick. You're beautiful. Your thought process is beautiful. Find contentment in who God made you to be. You, you won't have prosperity in any area of your life unless you submit to the work of God's contentment first. Now, let us move together to a weightier matter for now. For I believe that we have already established the connection between contentment and peace. If you think it's tough to live without peace governing your finances or any of these other areas of your daily life or, or that I've mentioned or some that I haven't even mentioned yet, can you imagine what it's like not having peace governing your eternity? Millions of people live this way. And there are many people, millions of people that justify not having peace in the eternity and, and try to make Christian uh, men and women seem like they're simplest simple because we are preoccupied with eternity whereas those are the weightier matters of life those are the things that should preoccupy us and sometimes people run around they're frantic you can understand why this world is such a frantic place because people don't have peace and the reason why they don't have peace is because they don't have contentment but Jesus said peace I leave with you my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. John chapter 4 and verse 27. Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. Oh, these beautiful words of our blessed Savior. Jesus does not give us just any old peace. He gives us His peace peace his divine peace he, he gives us what is truly eternally good we saw Paul writing of this peace to the Philippians a little earlier in that fourth chapter the a little earlier than this passage that or the verse that we quoted earlier when he said do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and listen to what he says and if you do that he says and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus Philippians 4 6 and 7 now we are tapping into the true essence of godly contentment what is it it's a guarded heart it says the peace will guard your heart true christian contentment speaks of a guarded heart a heart that cannot be shaken by the appearance 
of lack. I say it's just an appearance because sometimes it can appear that you've got lack around you because you can't see the provision of God, God making a way for you. You know, if God's going to put a ring on your fiance's finger, he's going to do it. And when he does it, he's going to do it masterfully. If that is what they mean by the theology of poverty, then I'm in. I'm all in. You see, contentment is not surrender to the type of poverty that would see your children begging for bread. Oh no. Contentment is surrender to provision. God's provision. Contentment is surrendering, saying, Lord, I know you love me. I know you care for me. And I know that as a loving Heavenly Father, you're going to provide for me. Contentment is surrender to what God sees fit for you to have or what God sees fit for you not to have. Yes, we are called to surrender to the work of contentment, but we are also invited to express our needs and even our desires to God. Did you pick that up in what Paul wrote in that verse we just read? Yes, surrender to contentment, but also feel free to express your needs and desires to God. Those things, the lack of which, may cause us anxiety. What does it say? By prayer and by supplication with thanksgiving. Now, I'm not going to break too much into that verse right now. We don't have scope for that right now. But listen, it, it is not the case that because you ask God for these things that you're greedy or covetousness or covetous or ungrateful or discontent. No. Contentment does not mean that we don't have desires or, or that we don't articulate those desires to God. God loves it when we express our heart's desires to Him. Contentment is seen in how you respond to how God responds to your requests. So in other words, God may say to you as He said to Paul, Not now. My grace is sufficient for you. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. If you want to know the condition of your contentment and the health of your contentment, then, then here is a very accurate gauge by which to measure that health. Ask yourself how it affects you when God says no to you. It is good for God to say no to you from time to time. In fact, it's better for God to say no to you more than less. Because sometimes we ask God for things that are not right. Or not healthy or may seem good now but will lead to pain later let's trust that God knows these things good for God to say no to you never forget that you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God and God does not have spoiled kids remember I spoke earlier about how children appreciate things how it blesses my heart when my children show appreciation for the things that I give them well God is just the same Jesus is the firstborn son of God. He's the darling of heaven. And yet Jesus said to his father, Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty two forty two. Now lest you forget, when Jesus said these words, he wasn't trusting for a raise or believing for a promotion or, or waiting for fame to come knocking. Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane the night before facing the agonizing death on a cross. Yet even at this time, even at this gut-wrenching, blood-sweating moment, Jesus' request was underpinned with the words, Not my will, but yours be done. And boy, am I glad that the Father's will was for Jesus to face Golgotha. Because if Jesus didn't, you and I wouldn't be sons and daughters of God Most High today. God could have rescued Jesus with 12 legions of angels, but he didn't because there was a bigger picture attached to the cross. There, were, there was more to God's no. Whenever God says no to you, you must realize that there's a bigger picture. God's not saying no just because he wants to be spiteful. There's a bigger picture. God has a very good reason for saying no to you. 
If you believe that scripture is true, then you will know that the Lord will never withhold any good thing from you. Any good thing from those who walk uprightly. Psalm 84, 11. Something may be good, but it may not be good for you. I have, I have found that there are times where the thing that I desired was good. I trust in my heart that at that stage I was good in Christ Jesus. But the mix not good so we got to trust that God knows when the mix is going to be good you'll get it you see if the Lord chooses to withhold something from you then contentment requires that you rejoice just as much in his withholding as you would in his giving uh, you, you, you rejoice just as much in God's no as you would in God's yes this is why, in order to walk in godly contentment, you will be required to walk closely with God. Because how else would you know what He sees fit for you to have or what He sees fit for you not to have? You see, those periods of lack are not designed for you to throw a hissy fit or to sulk, but it's designed to draw you closer to God. You say, Lord, well, you've withheld it. Let me walk more closely with you, Lord, to find out why it is that that which I requested was not good. And let me tell you, you will find out. And then you will rejoice in God's wisdom in your life. In His wisdom for saying, Not now, my son. Not now, my daughter. See? A spoiled kid doesn't realize that God's no will allow you to get to know Him better. You will get to know His generosity his wisdom, his loving kindness, and many of his other wonderful ways through his no, in ways that you could never get to know through his yes. I, I remember when me and Bren were married. On the first morning of our honeymoon, God gave us a marriage gift. You know, when in, in, in our wedding, some of our friends and family brought gifts that they blessed us with, and God was no different. He also blessed us with our wedding gift. But he didn't give it at the marriage ceremony. He waited for the first morning of our honeymoon when we could be alone and we could be quiet. You know what that gift was? It was a precious scripture from the Bible. The Lord blessed our marriage with a gift from the scriptures. This was his wedding gift to us. And how precious it has proven to be over the years. He led us as a young couple young excited couple we're still young and excited man he led us to Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 4 where he promised even to your old age I am he and to your gray hairs I will carry you I have made and I will bear I will carry and I will save shall I read that again God said even to your old age I am he and to your gray hairs I will carry you I have made and I will bear I will carry and will save now just to think that by sitting and listening to this message today it's no coincidence you're listening to this message but just to think that by listening to this message perhaps by now you haven't yet but now this promise is being given to you as well. Right now, wherever you are, God is making the same promise. He's going to carry and bear and lead and save you even to your old age and gray hairs. Claim that promise. It's for you. God will keep you to your old age. Wow! A, a true godly contentment means that you will never again fret because you don't have a pension plan in place. Going to get a little bit controversial now, hey? God is your retirement plan. Now, I'm not saying that you should be irresponsible in your savings for your golden years. I'm not saying that at all. If you have the means to do so, then by all means, lay something aside. But you know, because of the economies of the world today, not everybody is able to do that. There is so much pressure on people today. Not everybody can lay something aside 
for their old age they, they're just battling to get through day to day and and they are just putting the laying their their, their, their their lives and their future in the hands of God for those people who can't lay something aside I want to give you Isaiah 46 and verse 4 Isaiah 46 4 if you had the means I know that you wouldn't be blowing your money on irresponsible things that you would be putting something aside but life has put you in a position in a circumstance right now where you just don't have the means to do that you're so busy putting your kids through school or affording the bills or putting food on the table you can't scrape two pennies together right now let alone lay something up for something in the future Isaiah 46 verse 4 my brother my sister I give to you latch on to it claim it God has made a promise until your old age gray hairs he's got you he's gonna lead he's gonna save he's gonna provide for you and keep you I love that word keep you listen to me closely God is your retirement plan now he may lead you in the future where you can have something to put aside in a plan well then put it aside but I also want to warn those of you who do have the financial means to save for your retirement. Listen to my heart. I speak lovingly as a brother to you now. Don't put your trust in anything as uncertain as the economies of this world. I'm sure that you have all heard of those horror stories of some folks who have had their life savings wiped out by an unscrupulous financial advisor or wiped out by a crashed e economies remember 2008 eh? or because of an unforeseen medical expense what about those who have lost everything due to a global pandemic these things do happen eh? would have thought it impossible just six months ago but these things do happen eh? these things do happen life happens but God has got you to your old age and gray hairs there, there are very few things as uncertain as the worldly financial systems uh, so why then do we invest so much into it just think about it man years ago there was a, an oil refinery off the in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere I stand to be corrected but mm, and, and there was some sort of a disaster with that oil refinery it affected the global economy this is how finicky the world's financial systems are and yet we place so much trust in these things if you are investing all your money into a pension plan it shows you you're you, you, you're just saying well I'm putting all my bucks in there and I just hope that some catastrophe doesn't happen because like that can be wiped out now, I don't I don't mean to to come and upset you I, I don't mean to rob you of your peace but I mean to transfer your peace from the financial systems of this world and put it into something far more certain far more sure foundation and that is in God himself because God cannot be shaken why are the storehouses the pension plans the storehouses of this world so appealing to so many Christians or spiritual people when you don't have it your peace is shaken no man Isaiah 46 verse 4 a pension plan it is a good thing to have a pension plan if you have the means to save for one but I ask you what can be a better example of laying up for yourself treasures on earth than a pension plan you work hard for your money and then you lay up your money where you don't have access to it for years and after you've laid up that money then you lie awake at night stressing about it worrying about the integrity of your financial advisor the economy your health or the next plague to hit our planet no dear saint there's a better way the Apostle James chastises those who covet the future pension plan coveting the future the Apostle James said come now you who say today or tomorrow or next year or when I am retired all right so da James didn't say all that go read it for yourself James but, but it has bearing on what we're saying today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit yet this is this is the important part 
yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, and then vanishes. James 4, 13 and 14. Isaiah 46 verse 4 also held another wonderful promise for that newly wed couple, me and my bride. And it's a promise we've been holding on to and gives me peace to this day. Do you see how contentment and peace go hand in hand? Let me explain. We know that South Africa is one of the most violent and criminal societies in this world. Violence and crime are rampant. I read a, something in the newspaper. This is, this is genuine. A little while ago, hijackers hijacked a couple, stole their car, drove off. Wasn't far. Those hijackers got hijacked. Man, you. If it wasn't so serious, it would be funny. Those very hijackers got hijacked. The same car. Listen. As a young couple, shortly after we returned from our honeymoon, Brett and I had to get back to the normalcy of our life. Which means that we had to go back to our daily workplaces where we worked. Okay, so we've just had a power failure here. But we're going to keep going as well. We're going to be working on backup. As long as you can see me and can hear me, that's what's most important. So in the mornings, I would go and drop Brent off at work and uh, give her a kiss goodbye. Okay, I know a little bit too much information. But I give a little kiss goodbye and we would go our separate ways. And I, I would head off to my workplace and, and she would head off to hers. Now it was around, around about this time that Port Elizabeth experienced a series of ATM bombings and armed robberies in workplaces. Now some of these things happened at a mall that was very close to Bren's workplace. Bren would often patronize that mall during her lunch hour. And you only have to guess the kinds of thoughts that the enemy would place in my mind back then. Oh boy, did I start freaking out. He started dropping all sorts of lies into my heart. And although unspoken, the anxiety over my wife's safety started growing inside of me. It started robbing me of my peace. And you know, sometimes you don't even realize how this anxiety is growing until you've walked down a far road with this thing, man. All of a sudden, the Lord got hold of me, and he started dealing with me. He said to me, Warren, and I felt him speaking to my heart now. In case of that, that was a firm, stern Warren. Warren, didn't I promise you that I would keep you and your wife until your old age and gray hairs? In order for me to keep you in your old age and gray hairs, Warren... I need to get you there, don't I? Warren? He used Warren a lot when he's cross with me. Do you think that some ATM bombings and business robbings or any other threat of violence can keep me from keeping you? Never, no never, no never. Now Warren, if you're going to have peace in your times, then you're going to have to find contentment in my promise it is a very good gift see how that word of Isaiah I will keep you listen to me my brother or my sister do you realize that God will keep you do you realize that no matter what the economies are going to do God is going to keep you do you realize that whether you're old or whether you're young God is going to keep you do you realize that even in the midst of a plague or a pandemic, God is going to keep you. There's nothing that can stop God from saving, whether by many or whether by few. Nothing. God will keep you. And that was a loving rebuke that God put on my heart because instead of holding on to his promise, I started lending my ear to the enemy who started speaking to me and, 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 and infusing and injecting the fear of the times into my heart. And God would not have it with me. And let me tell you, God will not have it with you. God does not want his people to be a fearful people. The Lord has also given me another very good gift from, from Isaiah. And oh boy, he's given me good gifts all over the world. And, and when you can get to have these words and see that, that these scriptures are promises for you, man, it's going to 
invigorate your, your, your scripture reading again. You claim them for yourself. But in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13, God gave me a promise. He said, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. Wow. Wow. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has promised that He will personally tutor my children. Now I mentioned this promise. I could have mentioned any of the other promises that God has given me. But I mentioned this promise because I know that their children's education is a big source of concern for so many people. And I want to tell you Isaiah 50, 53 uh, and verse 54 and verse 13 has promised God will teach your children can you claim that can you claim that it's not just saying that he will teach your children spiritual things although that certainly is included but it says your children will be educated by God this means that their current and their future education has already been provided for because God's tutelage is complete like everything else God does he does it perfectly my children being taught by god does not only involve their spiritual lessons it involves all of their education if they are to be taught one day and if god sees it fit that one day they will be taught in a community college then praise be to god praise be to jesus as uh, their parents me and bren will find contentment in what god has ordained for their education by the same token if they are to be educated at the most prestigious of educational institutions, we will be content with that as well as parents. But one thing I can assure you is that this set of parents won't be spending a moment gasping in the anxiety over the, uh, uh, over the matter. No ways. We've handed it over to God. We are entirely dependent upon Him and we are entirely content in His provision for our lives. Now, if we had the means, we'd write a check. Praise God. I'd also like to, if we had the means, write a check for children that are not ours as well. Because I, I, I believe we must be that kind of blessing for people. If we had the means. But right now, we don't. But I want to tell you something. God has made us a promise. may not have the means, but we have a promise. And as parents, we'll do the very best that we can to provide for our children. But ultimately, their future is in His hands hands and by the way our, our father has also added to this promise of educating our children if you read a little bit further it says and great shall be the peace of your children now that is a very good gift how many of us wish oh god that we would know like we know that our children will live a peaceful happy joyful life they will not suffer from depression they will not suffer from anxiety they will not suffer from any kind of mental ailment great shall be the peace of our children well god has given us that promise in isaiah 54 13 go and claim it and if your child has been suffering from some or other ailment that has robbed them of their peace you need to rebuke the devil and stand on the scripture because god has given you a promise be more vigorous in claiming that promise and speaking it over your children it is available great not just little not just little bit great shall be the peace of your children paul made an amazing statement about contentment he said i have learned in whatever situation i am to be content i know how to be brought low and i know how to abound in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. You see, it's a secret. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Philippians 4, 11 and verse 12. Wow, we're getting a lot, of out, of, a lot out of Philippians chapter 4, aren't we? You see, yeah, Paul, that's the great apostle Paul, needed to learn the lesson he said i have learned it didn't come naturally he needed to learn the lesson of contentment if you have not done so already you will need to learn to be content and then i dare say you will need to relearn the lesson many times again it's just like you'll just get it then all of a sudden you'll find yourself 
getting a quiver in the liver because you don't have or you feel you have lack, then you'll need to relearn the lesson again. And then you'll master it. And then, without even realizing it, you'll, you will have wandered down the path of covetousness or ungratefulness once again. In, in fact, uh, you, you will know that you have learned the lesson of contentment when the struggle is over. When you have stopped struggling to be content. You see, so many times you go, oh man, oh man, am I content? Oh man, you will know you're content when that struggle is over. Just the sense of peace comes into your heart. The sense of being. The sense of being present. I heard a wonderful saying once that said, if you want to be happy, then be. I say the same thing. If you want to be contentment, then just learn to be. So much of our worries have to do with the future. If you learn to be present with God today in the presence, you will learn contentment. But listen, don't worry. The Holy Spirit will get you to where you need to be. But by the same token, let me just say to you, don't get impatient with yourself. This is how we learn. We fall and then we get up again. The great thing is that you, you won't have to start from all over. You will always build on where you left off and on that foundation. So that's the good news. But here, here's the thing. By the same token, don't get impatient with those around you who are also in the process of learning this wonderful, priceless lesson of godly contentment when they seem to be unappreciative or ungrateful don't get angry or annoyed with them remember you were there too you may be there now you will certainly be there again sometime in the future and then you will have to relearn the lesson of contentment again one closing thought and I do realize that I've not given nearly as much attention to this idea as I should have and perhaps we'll do that again sometime in the future did you notice that Paul said that he also learned how to be content in abundance and in plenty he had to learn it some of you are going to have to learn how to be content in abundance some folk spend so much try time trying to learn to be content in lack that they haven't realized that that's not what contentment is about. It's not what contentment is about at all. It, contentment is not just about learning how to be happy when you have li very little. No! Contentment is not just about making peace with lack. Contentment is a state of peace and satisfaction in any and every circumstance. Sadly, there are so many folk who don't know how to enjoy the abundance that our Father loves to bless us with. And He does. Often, God loves to just bless us with abundance. God far prefers to give us stuff than He does in withholding stuff. That's just the nature of the God that we serve. It's just that contentment prepares us for that stuff that God loves to give us so that we always remain appreciative so that we never get like spoiled kids contentment will teach you that an unhealthy preoccupation with poverty is just as covetous as an unhealthy preoccupation with wealth some of the most materialistic selfish people that I have ever known have ranked amongst the poor doesn't mean because they're poor that they're any more spiritual than anybody else Instead of their poverty serving as a blessed relief from the distractions of money, it has been the cause of a fixation on money. They're always stressed about where the next buck is coming from, where the next money is coming, how they're going to get... No, 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 no. You see, they've also slipped into the trap. Stress and worry about the future or earthly provisions is a sure indication that it is not contentment that fuels those emotions but that nemesis of contentment called covetousness. There are also those cases where some of the poorest people have proven to be some of the happiest. And as is the case with some of the wealthiest people, they have also proven to be some of the happiest as well because they have learned how to be content, content in abundance. Contentment has little allegiance to either wealth or to poverty. 
It has to do with that blessed state of rest and satisfaction in Christ Jesus. Some people have found contentment in their families. Some have found contentment in their careers or in their sports or in their gardens or even in their pets. And these are innocent enough. But these are not true contentment. True contentment can only be found in the one true God. It is priceless. But oh my brother, oh my sister, it can be yours. So if you're going through a, a, a path right now where it seems like you're going through lack, I want to remind you, God is in charge of your lack. And the same God that withholds, He does so for a reason. It's because there's something of much greater worth that He wants to release in you. But He doesn't want that which He gives you to ever control you. He is preparing you so that you will always be a steward and as a steward be able to control that which he gives you trust in him know that he is good and allow the work of contentment to complete that which God has designed and destined for your heart oh that you could come to that place of utter peace and rest knowing that your God who is in full control over all circumstances in your life is also in control of what he has permitted and what he has disallowed. And he has done so because he loves you more than you can ever know. When you tap into that, you'll know that blessed priceless gift of contentment. Let me pray for you. God, how good you are to us. Oh my Lord, my heavenly Father. Lord, this wonderful gift of contentment. There are times in our life where we have to go without, not for the sake of going without, but for the sake of acquiring, acquiring that most blessed and beautiful gift, that gift, that discipline of contentment. I want to release right now, Lord, that blessed gift over my brothers and my sisters. Oh, Lord God, if it is for the lack of contentment that they have been deprived of anything in their life oh lord would you speed up that gift in their life speed up that wonderful ability and discipline of contentment i want to speak the grace and the peace and that sense of satisfaction in you and only in you oh god let our satisfaction not be in anything else but lord some of us are going without some things that really do matter in our lives matters of provision not just for us but for our children or our family oh lord let us become so overwhelmingly convinced that you are in control of all of these things because in that knowledge lies the peace that we need in that knowledge lies the peace that we so desperately desperately crave the peace of contentment lord nothing has escaped you nothing has escaped you and Lord God, you are sovereign over all things. Let this knowledge be the source of our contentment and peace. For I ask this in the name that is above every other name. The name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. And until we meet again in the week that lies ahead, may you be blessed and may you be content in your blessings. Bye-bye.